thanks very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I, that's what happens when you drink. Empty <laughs> <laughs> now. Now it's empty. Uh, okay, so maybe I should just start by apologizing because I haven't been working in geophysical flows, mathematical study of geophysical flows for uh, some time actually. But uh, I guess I was sort of asked to present you some mathematical methods in geophysical flows. So this talk is going to be very, quite basic actually. There won't be any recent results at all. But I just want to show you some methods that can be used to prove some results on uh, some models in geophysics. So everything will be very elementary, but uh, just, I hope you'll just leave the room with some ideas of some different methods. I guess most of you know at least what parts of what I'll be talking about. Maybe no one knows everything I'll be talking about, hopefully. Uh, anyway, we'll see. So, um, so the models, again, will be as simple as possible. Um, I'll show you three, essentially, which will be uh, modeling Let's say first, uh, I'll be looking at, at the oceans or the atmosphere. It won't change very much uh, in what I'm doing at mid-latitudes. I'll have two models at mid-latitudes, either on some, um, let's say, small uh, length scales. I'll be explaining what I mean by that later on. That will be model one. I'll have also larger length scales or geographical zones. Uh, around uh, some mid-latitude, um, given mid-latitude, and then I'll be looking at a model of a shallow water equations uh, near the tropics. So the idea is behind those three models, there'll be three different types of equations with different kinds of waves and different kinds of, of uh, limiting behaviors, and so different kinds of mathematical <coughs> models to describe what's going on. Okay, that's just the idea. Just three examples to show you different kinds of methods we could be using. And the idea in all those cases will be that I'll write down the equations. So to start with, I'll just have some continuity equation. So rho would be the density, u the velocity. And let me write it in this way. Um, maybe we'll have some viscosity, maybe not. But let me just pretend there is a moment. And I'll add rotation. So I'm just writing down the Navier-Stokes, uh, compressible Navier-Stokes equations in a rotating uh, frame, right? So omega is the rotation vector. And I'll just put some equilibrium here with uh, the pressure, for instance, or anything else, any, any kinds of forces you could imagine. Maybe let me write this down properly if I can. So, okay, some pressure. Maybe I should put some density here to make this better. Okay, and then I have some forces maybe. And that's a general equation. That's not what I'll be trying to solve. That's essentially the kind of equation I'd like to look at. Rho is the density. could also be the height of the water if you're looking at a, at a shallow water equation. So that would be a continuity equation, uh, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. Okay, so now if I want to, give, uh, to find some small parameters in the equation, Obviously, the Rossby number will be appearing here. Omega will be assumed to be very large. And um, so let me call maybe uh, theta the latitude. Phi would be a longitude. And, and I'll be writing things around some given latitude. Theta zero is given. Either it's zero if I'm at the tropics or some fixed number if I'm at the mid-latitudes. And so, just a change of variables now, I'll be writing everything in um, some kind of Cartesian coordinates. Let me call x1 the longitude variable, and to make it with uh, the correct dimensions, so I'll just uh, try not to, to write things properly, so I'll call r0 will be the uh, radius of the Earth. I'll call L the horizontal a length scale, okay, and D would be the vertical scale, and in the case of shallow water, I'll be assuming D is much smaller than L, okay, and in any case, R0 will be much larger than L or D, okay, and then the change of variables I want to write are the following, so X1 will be just phi cosine of theta zero, 
And then x2, so this is bad. Uh, OK, I should write it here. This is x1. And x2 would be theta minus theta 0. That's a, that's a uh, latitude uh, times uh, r0 over l again. OK, so I just write everything in, in uh, non-dimensionalized uh, um, coordinates. x1, x2, x3 will be the vertical variable, so I'll just neglect it in the shallow water case. I won't in the other cases. So to make things correct again, I just put 1 over d r minus r0, where r is the radial variable. OK? So if you do that, then you get uh, equations. Let me give you the small parameter, which will be the Rossby number. Uh, so the typical velocity 2 times the rotation of the Earth times L. This will be assumed to be very small. That's the Rossby number. And then in the end, you come up with three types of equations. And those are the three equations I'll be studying for the whole talk. OK, model 1, 2, and 3. So let me write them down uh, as follows. So model 1 is when theta 0 is given, far from 0. And I'm going to assume that uh, theta doesn't change too much. So the Rossby number is essentially a constant. Uh, and so that's the f-plane <coughs> approximation. where f is 2 omega sine of theta 0. So of course, if theta 0 is near 0, then we'll, ha we'll have to linearize this. But for the moment, this is fixed. And I'm assuming the region of space is not so large, so the correlative force will be a constant. So then the model I want to study today is simply an incompressible equation, actually. I'll put some viscosity, although I probably won't be using it very much. Then I have u perpendicular, which is just the rotation of pi over 2 of u. u is u1, u2, u3. u perpendicular is minus u2, u1, 0. And that's equal to minus 1 over epsilon, if you like, gradient of the pressure. Everything depends on epsilon. So I just rescale the pressure so that I have this equilibrium between rotation and um, incompressibility. So this is a, a very easy model. I assume now that the density is a constant. So I'm looking at an, inc an incompressible equation, Navier-Stokes equation with rotation. OK, and again, I, I just want to show a few methods to make things as simple as possible. I won't put any boundary conditions at all. So I'll just assume that my variables x1, x2, x3 belong either to the whole space or uh, in a periodic box or any combination of the three. OK, uh, for some reasons, I'll be periodic in x1, x2 and the whole space in x3, for instance. All right. So this is model one. Model two will be essentially the same thing, except that I want to uh, assume that my uh, latitude is in the extended zone, so I can't assume the correlative force is a constant anymore. So the only difference is that my correlative force is now depending on the horizontal variable, so I'll call it xh the horizontal variable. So xh is x1, x2. And I have this function b here, which will not vanish, and which is telling me that the correlative force is now depending on the latitude. OK. And then the third model, as I said, will be a shallow water equation, a little bit different, where I'm going to assume that the height of the water, I'm near the, the, the tropics here, is a constant, let's say, plus epsilon times something. OK, so the epsilon will be the rotation and the height of the water. OK, and the height of the situation of the height will be called eta. And so you get an equation of the following type. So I'm assuming the height of the water is, let's say, to make things simple, 1 plus epsilon times something. OK, plug that into the continuity equation, divide by epsilon, and you get an equation which looks like this, plus some nonlinear terms which I should write down, I guess. So something like uh, u epsilon gradient eta epsilon, something like that. Let me just check where the epsilons are. Um, eventually. OK. Oh, sorry, I forgot the rotation, of course. And now, since I'm near the, equa the equator, 
my theta now I'm going to linearize around zero, so I get something like beta times x2, the epsilon perpendicular, it's a first order approximation, that's a better plane approximation. And then you get on the right hand side minus one over epsilon gradient eta plus a nonlinear term of this type. Sorry, this is on, no, sorry, I'm mixing up the velocity and the, okay, this is all wrong. That, that was the equation on continuity equations, much easier. I just have, as I was written, writing before, divergence of eta u. And then on the velocity, I get the rotation, the nonlinear term. So 1 over epsilon beta x2 u epsilon perp, that's rotation. And then you get this additional term coming from the, the fact that I divided everything by epsilon. OK, so here are three models, one, two incompressible equations with either a fixed or, or a variable rotation vector. And this, the last one is a kind of compressible equation with or that viscosity. I didn't put any here with uh, this uh, correlates term, which is the beta plane. OK, I've linearized the, around the latitude. So now let me see how this goes up. Okay. Right, so we'll I'm use. Sorry. Yeah. Gradient eta epsilon. That comes from the nonlinear term. If you write down, so is that correct? Um, yeah. The, well, I won't be using it at all anyway. Is a here? Yes, it is a vector. Eta is a function. Okay, so, so eta instead is a scalar. Eta is a, is a scalar, definitely. So that equation, so. No, that's fine. U epsilon is a vector, right? So I have eta times the gradient of eta, one half of gradient eta squared. Yes, it's potential it's energy. Potential energy. Yeah. Okay, eta is a scalar, right? So gradient eta is a vector. You see that just as a gradient term, like a force coming from the potential. Um, okay, well, okay. So what I, what I want to, to discuss right now is what happens when epsilon goes to zero? Okay, so that's a question, the only question I'll try to, to answer here is, What's the, the average behavior? Of the solutions of u epsilon or u epsilon eta epsilon in the last case. Uh, what would be, so that would be uh, the average behavior of u epsilon would converge to something. What would be the limiting equation? Average in some sense, right? I'll try to explain. What would be a limiting equation and in what way would you converge from u epsilon to that limiting behavior. Okay, so trying to understand to understand departure. So when I mean what I mean by average behavior would be like a weak limit, and the departure from the weak limit, meaning. And I understand that there are oscillations, waves going on around that weak average behavior. Okay, so in all those three models, we'll try to see what can happen. So the first thing we can try to understand is, in a very naive way, if you're given some nonlinear PDE with those one of epsilons hanging around, what's the weak limit of a solution if there is one? Okay, so all those models can be put into, can be recast into some kind of a, an abstract setting where you have some nonlinear operator, which is quadratic here, but it could be anything from, well, for the purpose of what I'm going to be saying later on. You could have also some linear operators like the Laplacian. Let's me put everything into this, this term. Maybe I can just call it n like nonlinear or whatever terms, plus one over epsilon, some operator and some linear operator L. That's exactly what I have up there. And the feature of L is that it's Q symmetric in L2, meaning that if you take any function, any vector field, depending on the model, phi, scalar product with L phi, then you get zero. 
that you see either because u perpendicular is, is perpendicular to u, okay, so the dot, the dot product vanishes, or by writing down an integration by parts when you have a gradient and a divergence. Okay, so in, both, in all cases up there, if you just take the integral of your one over epsilon term against the solution itself, in each case you'll get zero. Okay, so that's good news in the sense that all those models here have the same energy, meaning energy meaning the L2 norm, as if there wasn't that one over epsilon term, right? And so as soon as you write down an energy estimate, meaning you multiply your equation by the solution and you integrate, the one over epsilon term vanishes. Okay, so what you get for free for all those models, I won't write down the, uh, the estimates here, are a priori estimates on your solutions. They're bounded in L2, for instance. Okay, just because of that argument. So now that I know that I have a solution which is bounded in something, which is the first thing you should hope for if you want to get a limit, then you can wonder, well, up to some extraction of a subsequence, I have a weak limit. Meaning, if I look at any nice smooth function phi, <coughs> I multiply my u epsilon, uh, integrate in space and time. Maybe I should uh, maybe put a bar here. This will converge to something that we have to check, of course. What we have to check is what does that something look like? Okay, if I know I have a, a sequence which is bounded in space time in L2, which means u squared is bounded, u epsilon squared, then I know up to an extraction that there is a guy like that where phi is a tense function, so a very smooth function, compactly supported, in T and X. So the question is, in each of these models, what should U bar satisfy? Okay, and what I claim, and it's very easy to check, and we'll check it together, is that L U bar has to be zero. Okay, and to check that, let me just check it on this model here. What I'm saying is I should multiply this equation by any test function, integrate in space time, and maybe what I, I can, what I can also do is multiply by epsilon. So I take any test function phi, depending on time and space, and I look at epsilon times dTU phi plus the nonlinear term N of U phi plus epsilon plus LU epsilon phi. And this is equal to zero, right? I'm integrating in space and time. So now, of course, you have to check in each model that what I say is correct. But essentially, because you have a priori bounds, what happens is the following. This dt I can put on phi, integrate by parts, okay? And now u epsilon is bounded in something, and I have an epsilon in front of it, so this goes to zero, okay? For the same reason, this is well behaved, because I have a solution to my equation in some sense. So I have a bound on this, maybe on a horrible space, like almost a distribution maybe, but that's okay, phi is a test function. Okay, so I have epsilon in front, so this also goes to zero. Right, so now you're done because you see that for any phi, LU epsilon times phi is zero, so at the limit, LU bar is zero. Okay, so that's a totally general uh, fact that as soon as you have a priori, uh, priori bound, then your weak limit should just cancel the, uh, the higher order term. That's all we're, we're saying right now. Okay, so now what we should do is look at all three models and see what should the weak limit be. So in model one, what's L? Well, my unknown is just U, small u, and L U epsilon, my definition, is, uh, how should I write this? I should write it as U epsilon perpendicular, which is minus U epsilon two, U epsilon one, and uh, zero, right? Okay, and I know the divergence of u epsilon is zero. So actually, my, my real nonlinear uh, skew symmetric operator is not exactly L epsilon, but I should be projecting that onto divergence free vector fields, right? Because I have this, co this constraint that u epsilon has to be divergence free. So the actual linear operator I have is a projector onto divergence free vector fields of this guy. Is that okay? that cancels out the, the gradient of the pressure in the, on the right-hand side. So now what does it mean to be in the kernel of that operator? Well, it means that, so I have a PL U bar is zero. That means that there is, a, there is some function P, a scalar function, such that minus U2, U1, where's two, two is up, so U1, zero, 
is equal to D1P, D2P, D3P. Right? I have to be a gradient for, for the projector of the divergence free vector fields to be zero. That means that D3P is zero, P doesn't depend on X3, which means that U2 and U1 don't depend on X3 either. Okay, so I get that D3 U1 is D3 U2 is zero, but then U is divergence free, so you also get that D3 U3 is zero. I have no boundary conditions, nothing, right? Okay, so what you get for free or almost for free is that the limits of your rotating fluid system as epsilon goes to zero should converge to something which only depends on two variables, which is, of course, very well known. It's a taylor proofman theorem. Okay? We have to prove something. All, all we're proving now, right now, is that the weak limit satisfies those constraints. I'm not, I don't have an equation on the weak limit yet, right? I just have constraints that should satisfy. That's all I know. Okay? Yeah. Model two, um, well, it's slightly more complicated because my nonlinear term now is, uh, well, I've added this rotation. So I have what? I have something like B of X H U2, B of X H U1, and zero. And this should be again equal to gradient. So you do the same, the same argument as before, and what you get as a constraint is that D3 uh, U1 is equal to D3 U2 is zero, but then you have an additional constraint that is that U gradients, the horizontal part of U, gradients of B, should also be zero, which is not something you get at all. In the first case, B is a constant, so this just doesn't exist. But if you just work out this vector equal to a gradient, this is what you get. Okay, so this is a, a, a very strong constraint. It says that the, essentially, it's not totally true, but essentially it says that the limit, UH should be a function of B. It's not exactly that, but if everything was smooth, that would be exactly what would be happen, happening. But U has to be orthogonal to the gradients of B. Okay. And now for model three, then again, you have to write down everything. Now my U epsilon is the 2D vector field U and the height eta. Okay. And uh, the, non -lin the linear operator is uh, beta x2 u epsilon per perpendicular and plus divergence e plus uh, gradient eta and divergence u epsilon. Okay, so it's slightly more complicated. And if you, if you compute the constraints that are satisfied by the limits, what you find is so you just work out everything. Well, I won't, maybe we won't do it in front of you. It's not hard at all. Just write it down. And what you find is that the divergence of u, sorry, u2 has to be 0 at the limit. And beta x2 u1 plus d2 eta has to be 0. OK. So this tells you something that's also well known, right? Near the equator, everything is confined, and, and particles tend not to leave the equator. U2 is zero at the limit. It's only a weak limit, right? You have lots of oscillations around that. But the average weak behavior is saying that particles should be just following the equator, right? U2 is zero. <coughs> and then U1 is related to the height of the water by this equation here. Yeah. Sorry, you just said the, on the average. What do you mean? And where is the time? There's, the average means just in this sense, averaging ah, in, sense, in this not sense. In the time. Not, in no, not a time, okay. no, no. The average in terms of expectation value versus any smooth. Exactly, so. exactly, exactly. So now the, the real question probably we have to, to wonder is exactly that. Is, that. is that a strong convergence or is it just an average convergence in this sense, right? Expectation against any sense function. And also, of course, what's the limit equation? All I have is a limiting behavior. I have a necessary conditions for the limits, but what's the actual equation those guys should satisfy? And everything will depend very much here on the boundary conditions and the model we're looking at. So the next question you want to address are, what would be, uh, what should I say, yeah, what, what should be
the waves associated with my problems, right? I, I found essentially the kernel of my operator, everything is going to the kernel, but what, what are the oscillations around this uh, limit behavior? And so since I put the easiest possible boundary conditions, it's easy, at least in two cases, to compute the waves because you can ju just Fourier transform. Okay, at least in the first case, for model one, whether I'm in the whole space or on, on a periodic box or any combination of the two, I can always take Fourier transform. So if I call K the, the wave number, which can be either, so if I'm in the whole space, it would be an R3. If I'm in the periodic box, it would be an integer. And then if I'm in a combination, it would be a combination, right? And now let me just, I won't do it, but you can just Fourier transform the linear operator, which is uh, easy. What you get are the following eigenvalues, which are plus or minus i. i is normal because my operator is Q symmetric. And then you have k3 over the size of k. So you see the eigenvalues here are either form a, a continuous spectrum if I'm in R3, or a uh, discrete spectrum if I'm in C3. Okay, and I can just compute them. I should have three, of course, I also have zero, but the only divergence-free eigenvectors are those. Okay, zero doesn't uh, correspond to a uh, divergence-free um, eigenvector. For number uh, three, you could also compute the um, eigenfunctions again. So this time I'm just gonna take Fourier transform in x1, I don't want to take Fourier in x2 because uh, the equation depends on x2, so that would be messy, right? But if you do that and then you just write down what happens, you find a nice, very nice equation, which was also well known. Nothing here is new at all. It's been known for a long time. You get that, that the u2 should satisfy, the Fourier transform of u2 should satisfy, I'm looking for lu is equal to lu eta is equal to i tau u eta. Right, I'm looking for the eigenvalues. I know they're, uh, they're purely imaginary. <coughs> and then you get this for, uh, as an equation. Again, this is uh, well known. Minus beta squared x2 squared u2 is equal to zero. Okay, and here you recognize something like, like a harmonic oscillator, right? And so you see that this guy here should be equal to some uh, odd number has to be, okay? So again, now you get three solutions. This is a third or order polynomial in tau. So you get three solutions, which you can compute, so, sort of. You can compute what they look like when n is large, when uh, beta is large, you can start looking at stuff, right? What's interesting here is that I've taken the Fourier transform in x2, so let's say x2 is an r, for instance, and you get that your eigenvalues are discrete again. Even though the x2 variable here I've chosen an r to make things simple, you get a discrete set of eigenvalues. Okay, so now I know exactly how those, uh, those uh, equations oscillate in some, in some sense. I know what the waves are. For number two, in general, I can't say anything, right? Because I don't know B. So I have no idea what's going on. I can't take Fourier transform in X2. I could take an X1 if I wanted to, or sorry, I could take an X3 if I wanted to. But B is a function of X1, X2, which I don't know. So I can't take the Fourier transform. I can't find waves. At least I, I don't know how to do that in general. OK, so let's see what we can say anyway. So the first thing I want to talk about is would be what would be the limiting uh, average equation, meaning all I have is a weak limit right, in the sense of averages against test functions. So as you all know, I can take as much as I like weak limits in linear terms, in the sense of distributions, that's fine. I can't do it for nonlinear terms, right? So if I want to find the equation, the limit equation, I have to manage in some way to find the limit, the weak limit of u dot u, for instance, u epsilon dot u epsilon. And in general, there's no reason why it, would, it should be u dot u. Okay, it's just not true in general. So we have to work to, to, to figure out what's going on. So there are two ways of doing things. There is a way which is I know what the waves are, so let me just decompose my solution to all the waves and then work and see what happens. It's one way of doing things. I'll discuss that a little bit. And the other way is saying sometimes I just don't know what the waves are. And I still want to find the weak limit. I, I still want to prove this. That's what we want, right? Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but that's what we'd like to prove. 
And so, um, actually, there are methods that, for some reason, turn out to work very well, which are known as weak compactness methods. So, when I say for some reasons that all the examples I know, in all the examples I know, that works, but in all the examples I know, it's a miracle each time. Okay, I have no idea why it's true. It can't be true in general because there are lots of examples where such a result is not true, right? But for all those models and for others, for some reason something happens at the limit and you can take a limit in the nonlinear term and find something, which is not always this. So let me just show you in a very easy way what, uh, how this works. Or maybe I won't have time, so I won't have time. So let me just show you the, the method in general. So what I wanted to show you, but I won't have time, but you can look at it. It's very interesting. It's a paper by Pierre Rignons and uh, Nader Masmoudi, where they were looking at the incompressible limit. I think it's the first time I saw this uh, working. They proved that the nonlinear term in the, incompressible, in the compressible equations in the limit when the Mach number goes to zero <coughs> converges to the nonlinear term you want by a weak compactness method. And I'll show it to you in the rotating framework because that's what we're interested in now. But the idea in general is always the following. You take your solution. Let me look, for example, at, mo at model one. I know it converges weakly to some guy which only depends on two variables, which is divergence free. So let me cut this guy into its average. Or this time, average means the integral over x3. <coughs> OK, let me pretend this is in the whole space, for instance, or in the periodic box, it might be easier, of size one, plus something else. I can always do this. Then it turns out that u epsilon, <coughs> dt u epsilon is bounded. Because if you take the, the integral of the first equation up there, the rotating term goes away because, of, well, we know it goes away. It's in the kernel, right? Guys who don't depend on x3 are in the kernel of the rotation term once you've projected into divergence free vector field. So dt doesn't have a 1 over epsilon in it. So dt is bounded, but we like that because that means you have compactness. Right? If you have a derivative that's bounded, that means you have compactness. So u epsilon bar, in fact, converges strongly. And so my notation is terrible because it converges strong, strongly to u with a bar below for some reason. I don't know why I did that. But anyway, so you have strong convergence on this part. So the nonlinear term, you can cut it into lots of pieces. You can say, well, it's the product of the averages, which is compact. So that converges strongly, and the bars are below plus some, some cross terms. But they're fine because you know you have weak, strong compactness. If one guy converges strongly and one weakly, then the product converges weakly. So this goes to zero. That's fine. And you just have to worry about what happens when two oscillating terms compete. Does that converge to zero or not? And then the miracle happens. The miracle is that you can write down an equation for this guy in a very easy way. Let me write it like this. And maybe I should try to write the exact equation that satisfies, if I can. Uh, OK. So actually, I'll rather write the curl, because it's easier. And what you get is something like, so the curl is a 3D vector field. And you get something like divergence, the horizontal divergence of the epsilon and minus um, D3, I think, the epsilon, something like this. This is not maybe totally exact, but something like that. Plus, of course, I mean, lots of terms, but all the other terms are of size epsilon, because I've multiplied the equation by epsilon. Okay, so the, the linear term gives you something of order one if I multiply by epsilon. When you take the curl, you get something like this. And then all you have to do is work hard on this guy, play with it as much as you can, until you manage to show it's equal to epsilon dt, which comes from that, actually, of something, plus the gradient of something else. That's the miracle. Okay, I don't know why it's true, but it works. So I'll just compute it, just do it. And actually, that's for model three, for model one, sorry. And for model two, what happens is you get the same thing plus a gradient term, something times gradient b. And you know that people in the kernel are orthogonal to gradient b. So when I'm going to project this guy onto the kernel of L, which I want to do to find a limited, limiting equation, all this will go to zero. Because guys in the kernel are orthogonal to gradient b. This has an epsilon in front of it, goes to zero. 
And this is a gradient. When you project it into divergence free vector fields, you get zero. Okay? So this is a weak compactness method, meaning you're trying to see how waves are behaving. That's a wave equation in some sense. Okay? And you use the structure of the nonlinear term very, in a very strong way to be able to conclude that the nonlinear term just goes to zero. Well, it goes to the expected nonlinear limit. Okay? So that's a very strong method when it works. I don't know, probably sometimes it doesn't, but when it does, it works very hard, very well, because I have no idea what the spectrum of my operator is. I don't know anything about the waves, but I still get the limiting behavior I wanted. Okay, so that's nice. So just to finish, because I guess I was slower than I thought I would be, let me try to put one down. Okay, it won't. Okay. So what I'd like to do just to finish is to see how to, how to make this more precise and how to get strong convergence, because this is very weak, right? It's in an average sense uh, in some way. It's not telling you what, what, what's really going on. It's just telling you some kind of uh, weak average behavior of your, of your flow. So if you want to be more precise, then it's time to look into waves more precisely. Okay, so just to tell you a bit more about uh, techniques you can use. So that was a weak compactness technique to get weak limits. And then what happens about strong limits? So I don't want to average anymore. I just want to say U epsilon converges to something strongly. Okay, well it can't be in general because for, in for instance for model one, you see you have waves. The solution, even as a linear equation, if I just look at the linear equation, I project into divergence three vector fields for model one. Right, this is just a linear operator I'm looking at just to see what happens. And you know the solution is going to be written in Fourier variables like something like this, plus or minus k3 over k times the initial data which you've projected onto the eigenfunctions. Okay, and this does not converge strongly. It just oscillates. So the only way to, even for, non for the linear equations, there's no hope for a nonlinear solution to converge strongly a priori. Except if you're in a continuous spectrum case. So this is uh, something very nice about the continuous spectrum is that if you have a linear equation with some dispersion relation, here it's k3 over k, which uh, has some curvature. Right, so you're not just going in a straight line. I'm not going to draw this. I'm, I can't draw this, but it's, a, it's some kind of surface, right, in 3D. It has curvature. As soon as you have a dispersion relation with curvature, it's not a theorem, but almost, then you have dispersion of the solution. Okay. So, for instance, you all know. I get, well, my, some of you probably know that if you look at the Schrödinger equation, then the solution in time disperses like 1 over t d over 2 times the initial data in L1. Okay, and that's obvious. You just write down the Fourier transform of the solution, and that comes out for free. Okay? For the wave equation, you probably know also that you get a dispersion of d minus 1 over 2. Because again, the dispersion relation for the wave equation is not a straight line in dimension higher than 1. Here, our dispersion relation is this, this thing here. Okay? And what you can prove, which is uh, not totally obvious because the dispersion rela relation is not so easy, not so nice, but still by the same kinds of methods as for the wave equation, which means stationary phase methods, you can prove that the solution to this equation in L infinity uh, decays like 1 over t 1 half, I think, <laughs> yeah, uh, times the initial data in L1. Okay. That's if epsilon is equal to zero. If you have an epsilon, then you get epsilon here. So it might be one quarter, actually. Okay, so if you're in the whole space, using those dispersive estimates, which are very old results in general, but for other models, and for this equation, it's relatively uh, recent, you can prove dispersion. Once you have dispersion, you have um, what you, was more known as strict cards estimates, which I won't uh, show you, but which tell you basically that the solution in some space-time norm Okay, this one goes to zero like some power of epsilon. Okay, so I was telling you before, you don't have strong convergence for such an equation. Yes, you do if you have continuous spectrum. And this is very general. 
right? So as soon as you have continuous spectrums and curvature on your dispersion relation, then your solution goes to zero in some space. It has to put assumptions, which I won't do right now, but uh, of course you have to assume something on the initial data, but it's just bounded in some space, like in the energy space. Then the, the solution decays to zero, and you can put a force here, and it works also with a force in some space. You can also put, if you like, the epsilon gradient the epsilon. Okay, as soon as you have an energy estimate, you have a bound on this thing, and this still works. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that the solutions to the rotating fluid equations with a fixed rotation term, in the case of the whole space, or actually if you're in the bounded domain, let's say the torus, but, but uh, K3 has to be continuous, then uh, you go strongly to zero with this, for this equation. Why zero? Well, it's a bit cheating because you don't have any L2 function in, in the whole space in X3, which does not depend on X3. Okay, so it's a bit stupid to go to zero. If you don't want to convert to zero, you should remove the horizontal average, which, the vertical average, which satisfies the 2D Navier-Stokes equations, and you prove that this solution converges to the 2D Navier-Stokes equation strongly. Okay, so that, that, all that can be proved. Yeah. No, 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 the, the, one part is not continuous, right? If I'm in T, okay, the last thing I wanted to say is that if you're in the, in a box, then of course this does not work at all, right? Waves don't disappear, they just come back, right? Like, just like for Schrodinger, Schrodinger here was an RD. And so what happens when you're in a box is that you have to take care of those waves, they just will never disappear. So you filter them out, and then you study resonances, because in a nonlinear term you can always write them down as a superposition of all those waves. And outside resonances, you have strong conversions. And then when you're very lucky, which happens, for instance, for rotating fluids, for instance, for this model, resonances actually are so few that your, li your limit equation is linear, essentially, and it's globally well posed. So one thing that's interesting with all those models, I think, is that th your limit systems are almost always much better than the original one. The original rotating fluid is 3D Navier-Stokes. It's horrible. No one knows how to solve it in general. The limits equation is 2D Navier-Stokes, right? For this guy, this equation you can't solve globally in general. The limit equation is linear, so it's global. And so all those models, except for this one, for epsilon small enough, you have a global solution, for instance, because of those kinds of estimates. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Aside from solving turbulence, whatever that means. Defining turbulence, sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, what would, we have some results that you think would be nice, I mean, yeah, obviously. in this style. Yes, uh, I think putting boundaries, obviously. And one thing I would like, uh, I've sort of stopped looking at those problems, but just this equation, start putting uh, boundaries like beaches or whatever and yes. see what happens, where the waves go. That's, are they absorbed or are they bouncing back? I mean, this is uh, very, very babyish, right? It's just no boundaries, just trying to understand waves. But I think what's really interesting is some, some people here are working on that hard, and they've even others, is putting boundaries and seeing what happens to all those waves. Yeah. So in other words, more like the topic of the system. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. A comment, uh, I have, is there any other comment or the question? I have uh, just a comment on the overall message you're conveying. So the overall message you're conveying, if I understand correctly, is that for some reasons, which uh, you know, let's call it the deus ex machina, things work surprisingly well when you take the limits. Mm -hmm. So um, can, we this, uh, can we interpret this as a sort of a, maybe a possible reason why the numerical modeling of all this stuff works somehow, has always been working somehow surprisingly well, even when people had no real idea how to perform these limits, if not right. uh, in a very heuristic. So it's somehow, it's very robust. So the equations you get uh, work well. As an example, the problem of resonance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You linearize the equation and surprisingly it describes well what you see. Mm -hmm, that's because right. somehow the nonlinearity is not strong enough. I mean, is this it's not, it's, it has a very special structure. It's a special yeah, structure. Yeah, that's so really it's very rare to see. Exactly. So, yes. But uh, like all those results, if you, you can say for almost any beta, there are no resonances, for instance. Yes, there's yes. always something that's almost always 
Yeah, that's good, yes. And so numerically, I guess that but happens. They are, these are lucky equations in some yeah. sense, if, oh, you, yes. if you allow me, yes. Okay, that's good. good. Sometimes it's good to be lucky. Optimistic, yes. yes. The end of the day. Optimistic, yeah. At the end of the yeah. day. Yeah. Okay, good. Any, any other comments or questions? <laughs> Still along the same lines, if I may. I mean, uh, things like in middle latitudes, France, in other words, yeah. contact with continuities. I mean, since there, the nonlinearity is more yeah. interesting. Yeah. Do you think that there's something to be done? I think there is. A, I sort of forgot what was done in those things, but um, at the time, that was a long time ago, like the end, the end of the 90s, right? Uh, Nikolai Inko and Babin and those people had models for frontogenesis and things, which I, which I forgot, sort of. Mm. But, but it's a, a little bit in the same lines, I guess. And yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No? Thanks a lot again. Okay.